Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. In this podcast, I am joined today by Dr. Dennis Antoine, an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, who serves as director of the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy and director of the Addiction Treatment Services at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. And today we are discussing the issue of when drinking alcohol becomes a problem. So welcome, Dr. Antoine, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lily, for having me. I'm looking forward to talking with you more about this topic. So the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in 2019, so pre-pandemic, I'll say, reported that there are 14.5 million people ages 12 and up, and it's startling to say that young age of 12, had an alcohol use disorder in the United States. Could you please explain what alcohol use disorder is and the prevalence of drinking alcoholic beverages is in the United States? That's a great question. I usually start out when I hear that type of question by breaking down alcohol use and disorder. Alcohol use is very, very prevalent. And if you look at the statistics, approximately 85% or more of the population have actually had a drink over the course of their lifetime as an adult. And as you mentioned, that age is getting lower and lower with 12-year-olds and teens getting access in different ways, but 85% is the lifetime rate. If you look at the amount of people who've had a drink within the past year, it goes down to about 60 to 65%. But then if you see how many people have a drink in the past month, it's still around 50% for women. So it's very prevalent in how much use occurs. Uh, But the question is, what is disorder? And disorder is a little bit different when you get into what causes issues for the person. And I usually frame it as, is alcohol causing a problem for you? And that can have problems in different ways. It can be problems with doing the normal functions of your day-to-day job or maintaining a relationship or getting out of bed with the physical issues that can occur, but to the point where it causes, as we say in our diagnostic manuals, social dysfunction or difficulty functioning the way you would on a regular basis socially, that's when you call it a disorder. So there isn't a cutoff with the amount of drinks necessarily, but it's how it affects your day-to-day life. I'm sure that there are individuals who will say, oh, no, it doesn't affect me at all. I don't have any problem with it at all. But perhaps their family members are saying that's not true. He's missing time from work. He uh, comes home at two o'clock in the morning when he should have been home for dinner at six. And obviously that difference in opinion, shall we say, I'm sure can make it a whole lot more difficult to get someone in for treatment because if they're not able to be honest with themselves, then they're not going to acknowledge that they have a problem that needs addressing. There are often ties to alcohol use disorder with other things that we experience in life. And sometimes the alcohol plays a role in that person's life, feeling of positivity amongst other things that are going on. And there can be a process towards accepting that alcohol is a problem. And it sometimes rivals what you would see as grief, where there's a denial, like you're talking about. A person Uh has an issue and there can be a, a struggle and some anger maybe even some guilt that they've gone through this process. But at some point, hopefully a person could get to that point of acceptance that this is an issue uh, and that they're willing to let go of the alcohol. But as you pointed out, it can be a process and not everyone walks in at the beginning saying, I'm ready to give this issue up. As I just mentioned in those statistics, starting at the age of 12, and we're talking about kids that are in middle school, at what age should parents sit down and have a conversation with their children? about alcohol use? When you're starting to see more social interaction with peers, it's a good time to understand what's going on in that day-to-day basis. And I like to tell a lot of my clients now as adults, you know, you want to have a good understanding of the canvas of a person's life and probably understanding what the children and, and adolescents are going through is the best approach. If you 
come with the approach of, you know, this is alcohol, stay away from drugs. We've had that experience in the 80s of, you know, this is drugs, this is your brain on drugs, any questions? And sometimes that doesn't settle in and, and sink in with the individuals you're trying to reach. So I would advise at that age, adolescents and maybe a little bit younger, just understanding what's going on and making sure they have good examples of what to follow, things that, that are healthy activities that will rival and really compete with their desire to want to drink in the first place. That's an excellent point of doing something other than that, rather than defaulting to that. I also think that if they see a lot of alcohol use within their home, that frankly is setting an example, right? It must be okay. Mom does it and or dad does it or both do it, that it becomes normal. And that normalcy can result in youngsters saying, let me try this for sure. And you can think of other cultures where alcohol is prevalent. There are countries where the alcohol drinking age is lower than the United States, but often it's that culture of what else is around. It's not just alcohol and it's not the focal point of everyday life. It's something that might happen from time to time, but he's still going out and doing other things, being very active and involved in other cultures and, and things in life. So it's that balance to supplant the alcohol as the main reinforcer, as we often say in life, that, that's the key. And so creating activities for our young people is something I think in society, we need to do a better job. Kids are sitting home on their cell phones, right? They're just using their thumbs and their fingers and they aren't outside playing sports. They aren't doing activities in their neighborhood that involve physical activity. They're visiting at a friend's house and they're both sitting there playing some game. And that's really not in anybody's best interest. I want to see kids back on the ball field and back in the gym and doing things that are going to keep them physically active. Plus, it's good for their general health, too, because we know that young people also are having a weight issue, and it's because they're not as active as we would like to see them be. So we've all heard the term binge drinking, but how does it differ from what is known as high-intensity drinking? High intensity drinking and binge drinking are a similar in nature. Binge drinking, if you wanted to you know, quantify that, for women especially, that would be four or more drinks in about two hours. And for men, it would be about five or more drinks in, in about two hours as well. High intensity drinking is a special type of binge drinking where there's an occasion that comes up. And often it would be a Thanksgiving or a birthday. One example that often comes up where I work would be I had 21 drinks on my 21th birthday. And that would be high intensity drinking or something in New Year's or something around congregations of people that you know. And it's very identifiable and you understand what's going to be happening with that intensity. But it's a specialized type of binge drinking, essentially. I've seen some billboards, which I've been very pleased to see, that reference feeling a buzz on or uh, commercials, infomercials on television to start a better job of educating people that if you were feeling what I guess my parents would have said tipsy, I don't think they use the word anymore, that in fact, you should not be behind the wheel. And you're absolutely right that there are certain events, milestones and events that happen like your 21st birthday seems to be a day to go out and drink a whole lot because you can now, a rite of passage, I suppose. But we've just sent kids off to college. They are away from their parents who would have been responsible for their general health, for still having probably a curfew, I hope, what they're eating as far as their diet, et cetera, and how they're spending their time. Is there special advice to be offered for parents who are going to become empty nesters now and their kids are literally on their own and making some pretty significant decisions about their lifestyle choices? I would say that the patterns that are built in the home don't completely disappear when the children go off to college. So part of it, what I was saying before is still applicable that it's going to be really good to understand why they like the games and the video games when they're at home, because that might give you an opportunity to set them up with a pattern to earn that game. Maybe you can get 30 minutes if you do these things, if you mow the lawn or take out the trash or do these things that ultimately would set up a great pattern for them when they're independent. And that way there's less likelihood of them drifting to something else because they know they can earn these things. If they work hard and stay away from the substances or the activities that might deter them from succeeding over life. 
I would suggest that route so you have almost a conditioning before they leave rather than worrying and maybe helicoptering over them when they're gone, because that might be tough to maintain. I think it would be very tough to maintain, but I could appreciate the desire to want to do it. <laughs> it's, I have a colleague, and you can say this on both sides, moms are going to be moms, dads are going to be dads, and it's almost like your heart is on the outside of you now far away when they leave home. Uh-huh. It's understandable, but it, you want something that's going to be sustainable. So it's going to be very hard if you don't have something instilled in them growing up. I think a real worry for uh, kids going off to college is the sororities and the fraternities, especially the fraternities, I guess, that do things that are very unsafe when you're pledging. And alcohol usually is involved. So I recall myself having that discussion with our daughter, who, thank heavens, is now in her early 40s. So I felt like we got her through college, right? (laughs) But I also think that there is confusion about how much alcohol is needed to drink before it's too much. I'm going to give you a very personal example. I have not told people about this before, except my closest friends, but all of our listeners out there, I think will appreciate my personal story. When my husband and I got married 44 and a half years ago, we were invited to a special dinner that was being held by my husband's employment for people to be receiving awards. And this was going to be my first time meeting his co-workers, my very first time meeting his co-workers. We sat at a big table. There were 10 of us and I'm, you know, meeting these new people and trying to remember their names and all that good stuff. When a gentleman at the table leans down and picks up this very large glass jar and it had, I wasn't sure what was in it, but then when I looked at it closer, I saw that it was cherries and everybody went, Ooh, Oh, thank you so much for bringing them again. And I thought, why do people want to sit during this very lovely dinner of seafood and steak and eat cherries out of a jar? But here comes the jar, you know, going on around. And I'd see people take two stems out and put them in their mouth and go, ooh, thank you. So all these are great. So as the jar is coming around to me, I'm looking at that jar and I'm looking at those cherries in it. And I'm like, they don't look very red. They look like they're old. And I just blurted out and said, these look a little old. And he said, yep, they're a year old. They're perfect. Okay. So my husband had two. And up to this point in time, I had never had any alcohol in my life. I was 24. I just chose I'm not going to drink at all. It was just my personal decision. As you might guess, I scooped out two stems, put them in my mouth, thought it tasted like something that had fermented in a way that I now was going to die of salmonella or something and pulled the stems off and swallowed them because I thought, get this taste out of my mouth. And I looked at my husband and I said, what is wrong with those things? And he went, oh, they've been soaked in rum for a year. And I went, oh, well, 30 minutes later, I removed my pantyhose at the table. I have no recall of this dinner at all. I don't even remember us driving there. And my husband said to me the next day when I felt like my head was going to blow off, I'll make sure you never have alcohol again. (laughs) And I haven't. But what it taught me many things. But one of the things that it taught me was One person's tolerance, I guess, for alcohol can be very different than someone else's tolerance. And so I know folks that will have four drinks and they still seem like they're fine. And somebody else who has three drinks and you got to drive them home. So what is it about our, I guess, our metabolism or Mm. is it something else in our brain that is determining how alcohol may affect one person differently than another? So that we shouldn't be going by my teenage friend here can handle four beers. So I should be able to handle four beers. One way to put it is a lot of people take time to think about what effect alcohol has on our bodies and then what effect or what way does our body 
have a way of affecting alcohol or breaking it down. And that's the Uh the two-way conversation. So Uh I think to your question, the first part would be that alcohol affects a certain receptor in our bodies. And there's a lot of it in our brains. It's called the GABA receptor. And it's one of those receptors that just depresses our body, brings it down. Some people have more than others. And some of that is actually genetically based. Some people say that about 40% of alcohol use disorders is based on genetics. So we may be born with more receptors than other folks. And that can be a familial thing that's passed down. If a a family member or a group of family members have issues with alcohol, there's a higher likelihood that we'll be born with more of those receptors. So if alcohol comes into our bodies, we're going to be affected by that more than most people. And that would be one reason why you or I might have a different reaction than someone else down the street. The other thing about that, though, is as alcohol comes into our system more and more, our body adapts. And our body has a way of breaking down alcohol with a certain amount of receptors. And certain ethnicities and certain genders have different levels of that enzyme that can break down the alcohol. For instance, Asians in particular, and also Native Americans, are known to have lower levels of what's called alcohol dehydrogenase. That's the enzyme that breaks down the alcohol. So if a person were to drink, they would get effects a lot quicker because they aren't breaking that alcohol down. And there's also some other differences that are known out there. But what does happen if people drink that alcohol more and more, sometimes the body can compensate and say, I need to take this into account and I'm going to increase the amount of alcohol dehydrogenase in my system. I'm going to compensate for that. So those people may over time build up a tolerance But at the beginning, they would still be like a 24-year-old person walking off the street for the first time with alcohol. So there's a complexity there of what the alcohol does to the body and what the body can do to the alcohol. So you're educating us about what scientists have been learning as to uh, how the brain works and how our metabolism works or sometimes does not work. Do you also see that there's usually a higher incidence of overuse of alcohol if there are others that live in the family home that are regular drinkers? That's a great question in terms of nature versus nurtures is almost what I Uh hear you asking. The home can be an influence. You think about persons who may be adopted and they might be away from their biological and then you're thinking about who's in the home. More and more, as you pointed out, the societal influence is big. So it depends on how much they're in the home and what else they have going on. If they're running around doing sports and different activities, they may not be home as much as and influenced by that as much. So I think it depends on the rest of that context to say, but it would increase the risk a, a fair amount if they were always at home let's say even like during COVID when people were shut in and that's all you have around, there would be a higher chance of that influence for sure. Uh huh. So what are the signs of alcohol use disorder? What should we be watching for? I think there are a good amount of things to look out for. And first starts by, as I mentioned before, understanding what a person does on a regular day to day. And then as the use disorder starts to set in, the pattern of behavior will change and you'd start to see things narrow around alcohol. And so I imagine that person that you talked about at the dinner table, they probably bring that type of thing to most of their dinners and their functions. And that means their pattern of behavior revolves around the alcohol more and more. What you'd also see is people have difficulty doing things that are pretty normal for them. So waking up and going to their job on time or making sure they have something to eat for dinner at the end of the day, those things start to lapse and lapse and lapse. And I almost think of it like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill. Eventually that rock gets bigger and bigger and it's the alcohol that's weighing them down. Eventually it will take over a lot of their life to the point where they would have social consequences and interpersonal consequences and difficulty just carrying on their day-to-day life if it gets to that point. Do you find that most work environments provide help for employees who are dealing with this? I would say that the help is not necessarily on site, but from an employer standpoint, employers are pretty much mandated to be able to account for anything that might get in the way for their employees. It should be a connection to some type of assistance. Usually there is an an employee assistant programs at most jobs through their HR departments. That's something that is required. However, that might be connecting to a provider that's known in the area or uh, identifying ways to get more support if needed, but uh, usually wouldn't be connected with the job directly because there would be a bit of a conflict of interest and commitment there. 
How effective are these types of alcohol rehabilitation programs? I think the program is the beginning. Sometimes the length of the program can be good and bad. And I say that for a couple of reasons. Some programs, a lot of people call detoxes, where there there's quick times to get the alcohol out of the system and make sure you're medically safe. And, and those have a goal of getting the alcohol out of the system, but not necessarily long-term effectiveness because you still have to go back to the same place. And there's an old story about a, a prison in Kentucky a long time ago where people would stay for years at a time and they would get all this treatment, but then they would go right back to the same corner and right away they would relapse and go back in. That applies to your question about the programs as well, where you can have a good program and stay there, but unless you have a, a connection and a setup with where you're going back to and changing those, as a lot of people say, people, places, and things that get you in that trouble, it's going to be hard. But if a program works to make that connection and that shift, you might have a better chance. With what frequency is alcohol also tied with drug use? It all goes to the same receptor of the pleasurable response in the brain. So I would say that the pleasurable response is very much connected. However, what we would look at is the amount of time where there's co-use. A lot of times you'll see co-use of alcohol with cannabis. That's a very frequent thing. But you'll sometimes see alcohol and cocaine because there's a combination of those two drugs that leads to a higher response. But after that, you, you won't see as much co-use. So I'd say maybe about 30% of the time we'll see some co-use with other substances, but usually it would be alcohol that is a predominant thing with other drugs mingled in there from time to time. What other health issues can come about as a result of excessive alcohol use? Alcohol can be a thing that can work slowly on different organs, and then you eventually see things externally. The big organs that you would start to see is as you go down the course of drinking it. It can affect the esophagus. It can also affect the pancreas, which helps break down some of those things. And that's where you can get to some issues with digestion. You talk to people over time, they have difficulties eating food, digesting food, and it can lead to those internal issues. And the organ that tries to filter out all of this is the liver. That's where you get to more long-term difficulties with that liver really trying to work hard and uh, breaking down the alcohol as we talked about before. So the, the liver can get hard and damaged, which is what we would call cirrhosis. And then eventually it gets so scarred from all that work, it has a hard time functioning and you can get liver failure from that. One of the lesser common talked about, but very prevalent things that can also happen with long-term alcohol use is that it eats up a lot of the vitamins in the body and really takes them away from helping the brain function. When that happens, people have difficulty with memory, short-term and long-term, and there are special names for that called Wernicke's and Korsakoff's dementia, but essentially it's a byproduct of the alcohol taking all the thiamine and the other vitamins that would help you remember things over time. That's significant, certainly. And I live in the world of cancer at Johns Hopkins, so I also know that there are ties to alcohol use and certain types of cancer that can result in being developed. So how can families support those who are trying to overcome their alcohol use disorder? What can they do to be the yeah, most I mean, helpful? It, that's a great question. And I think that's a question that can apply to a lot of different behavioral health and mental health issues. Support is probably going to be the biggest thing because social support has been shown to be the biggest contributing factor to long-term improvement in any behavioral health issue. Sometimes the danger that we find is we want to help that person, but we also want to say, you need to stop doing this thing and you know we're going to make you do it and we're going to take all these things away. But that can lead to a recoil sometimes that could be difficult amongst the family and, and not necessarily sustain the change for the person. So I would try to gently and work with that person to say, what are you up for changing? We want to help you. We want you to feel better. We want you to be around with us. And we want to work with you on that and make sure they understand that you're with them on the journey not just trying to get rid of the disease that they're going through. That's with such that a thing, good point that, yeah, that they're yeah, with so them for this they, journey and that this isn't an easy fix. This isn't today's Friday, so I expect you to not ever drink again starting Monday morning. That's not how it works. And we certainly do know that. And yet there are family members that may have different expectations that they actually do believe that I told you to stop and come Monday morning, then you'll never drink again. Similar to smoking, some people can go cold turkey, but it's tough. 
and usually it does require a weaning process with the help of some other agents to make up for that nicotine so that you can gradually step away rather than just bang, yeah. I'm done and I won't do it again. Yeah. And I, and I wish we had some of those agents that were stronger for alcohol. I mean, we have some of those agents. And as you mentioned, I think sometimes it's important for the family to set expectations that are reasonable for the person they're trying to help and for themselves to say, I can only help so much. The other person has to contribute. And the medications can be helpful in that course as well for alcohol use disorder. We have now Trexone, which has been around for a while and works for certain people. If there's a configuration of those genetics in the brain, as I was mentioning before, and really works better if a person has been known to have a family history and a strong drinking history, we would think about now Trexone and having someone hand them the medication each day. So we know it's being taken. Overall, that support system needs to have good expectations, as you mentioned, and making sure that they're reasonable, not lofty as in terms of overnight, get it all done overnight. What impact do you think this has had on society at large? It's a big one. I mean, you're talking about a, a substance that had an amendment made out of it in the Constitution. We're looking at something that's really affected us for over a century now, if I'm doing the math correctly. And there have been movements like the temperance movement, teetotaling, different things financially that have been added to it, it changed laws of the drinking age. I think it's really made us think about what is the right age to be accountable? There was only other things that I can think of that has had that shift would be you know, going into the military or things along those lines. So I think it's really been a very big impact on society, but I don't think we finalized as to where it's going to stand because it's still affecting us with chronic medical diseases and it has a high impact on even mortality, rivaling, if not outpacing, opioid use disorder. So there's still a lot more work to be done. You serve as the director of the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy at Johns Hopkins Bayview. What do you see is your role as director about the problem alcohol plays in and after pregnancy for expecting mothers and also for their children? As a director, I'm really working with different disciplines, different providers to make sure there's safe care for the mother and the baby. That starts during pregnancy with making sure there's a great evaluation for the mother to know where things stand, to know if any previous use of alcohol has had any effects on the pregnancy and make sure there's a safe path to getting towards that delivery without or minimizing any impact on the baby. So I work with obstetricians, gynecologists to make sure we have that approach, and then also counselors to get that social support in place so there's a safe path after the delivery so we can decrease any interpersonal violence or other stressors that might increase a chance of relapse. If someone was planning and hoping, and their family also hoping, to be able to to become alcohol free. What is the average length of time from making that personal commitment and hopefully getting the family support they need to when we can say they are now successful? I've heard actors and actresses recently on television when they're interviewed saying, I'm 17 months free of alcohol or eight months free of drugs, whatever that it might be. Obviously, this is a lifelong situation. It's not, I stopped, I'm done, and I can never, ever deal with this again. It's a constant reminder, a constant, sometimes probably even battle. But what would you say on average would be the length of time? The literature would say that it depends on when a person starts. If they okay. were to start in their teens, usually it's 15 or younger, there's a, a longer course, if you will. It usually would be accompanied by some other mental health issue that might make things more complex. That's where you would be talking about, on average, probably somewhere towards 20 years as an overall course. That's if you have the social support in place and the treatment to get that accompanying psychosocial or behavioral health issue. When you're talking about people who might start later, there are definitely shorter courses, but the complexity of that makes it hard to say this is the overall number because a good amount of the time, about 40% of the time, you will find that there's an accompanying mental health issue that might need to be addressed. We would hope that it would just be the alcohol. We can take that out of the picture. But a lot of the times on that canvas of life, there might be depression or grief or whatever else may be going on. And that makes it hard to say how long would it be when a person says they want to stop, 
it would also be how long does it take to get into that psychiatrist or that medical person to help with the other things that might have come up. So it's, it's a complex, but a great question. If a mom is drinking during pregnancy, what impact does that have on the baby? There definitely can be neurodevelopmental issues. And what we would see most would be fetal alcohol syndrome, which uh-huh. would come up with certain facial features that may change and some developmental issues, but it's still an opportunity to maximize postnatal care and perinatal care to make sure that there's minimal harm to the baby. Sometimes that could be with some of the uh, vitamin repletion, as I talked about, alcohol can take things yeah. out of the system and there's an opportunity to correct some of that along the way and make sure there's good perinatal care so that the mother and the baby come out with as little harm as possible. But a fetal alcohol syndrome is the most likely outcome that would occur. And, and sometimes also a smaller birth weight that can occur as well. So for a postpartum mother, is there a risk that she might be thinking, well, if I'm not breastfeeding, then it's okay for me to resume drinking? I think it depends on what type of environment they're going back to and how much stress there is. Just like the prison example that I gave, anyone who's in a controlled environment, and sometimes being pregnant can be that controlled environment because you have to account for another person. And so when you're not in that type of setting anymore, there can be that temptation. What I try to tell people is, it's important to figure out what's going to replace the substance uh, when it comes time to go back to normalcy, if you will. So there can be the temptation after pregnancy to go back, but often our goal as a treatment provider would be to say, what are we going to put in place? Who's going to be around to help? What social services might be needed if you're talking about persons in a lower socioeconomic status? But definitely having that social support in place would help decrease the risk and enjoying the baby. Being able to enjoy that is, is a big part of that too. Yeah, for sure. And we want her to do that, don't we? Yeah. So at the beginning, I mentioned some statistics that were from 2019, which we call pre-pandemic, right? Everything is now measured pre or post-pandemic, it seems. I've been hearing in the news for the last two and a half years that there has been an uptick in the number of people that have been drinking more or drinking for the first time and drinking more in their home because they have been kind of held captive indoors. They're under a lot of stress, anxiety, worry. They don't have a paycheck coming in. They may have completely lost their job and it won't be back. They may have lost a family member to COVID, all kinds of triggers that can create depression, can create great anxiety and a lot of fear. And I realize that some people do turn to alcohol as a way to numb them so that they're not thinking about these worries all of the time. How much of an increase do you think we've seen as a result of the pandemic throughout the United States with alcohol over usage, I'm going to say? The numbers I would base it on would be what we've seen for most substance use disorders across the country, which is around a 33% increase, unfortunately. And it's for the reasons that you just stated. People are in more restricted environments where there's not much to do with a lot of stress that can be going on. And that is a common story that I hear that COVID came and whether I lost my job or lost a loved one or lost a relationship that just wasn't going well. Uh, things really have increased and there's been a demand for these services in a lot of different ways. But I would say about 33%. And there's going to be more, I think, research to see if there's differentiation between men and women on that. But I think the stress certainly has been across the board higher for everyone. What type of research is being done to uh, further our knowledge with this, as well as hopefully create some additional solutions? I think there is research looking at prevention, but then also treatment. And the prevention piece, I think, has a lot of expansion to be done. Uh, For instance, we we talked about what is used with alcohol, and that's how we know more about alcohol and cannabis. And maybe that energy drinks are usually a precursor to people relapsing. And there's more work looking on that end of things to figure out and predict what might get a person in trouble so we can intervene before it becomes an issue. And I think that's where some of the things during COVID are going to be very unique to look at since there are more stressors that have come up. In the public health and prevention side, there are a lot of people who are looking at that. On the treatment side, as we would think about for other medications, for instance, opioids, there are medications we can use to block the effects of opioids, but we don't have that necessarily for alcohol. 
Naltrexone is a medication that's been around for a while, but researchers are looking at what about naltrexone? What about the receptors that naltrexone works on? Can we think about that might make it more effective for persons with alcohol use disorder? That type of genetics or interpersonal individualized treatment is something that I think will have good promise to see what might change in terms of medications for alcohol use disorder. And then beyond that, figuring out what type of social makeup or what type of social environment is going to be best to sustain the changes. I think that's going to be very important, including thinking about things like spirituality and non-traditional medical things that might be incorporated into a person's care that might be important to them. I'm curious to know, and I'm sure that our listening audience is too, how did you end up specializing in this field? It's been a long journey of my own with this, but you know, when I started out in medical school, I was bringing in my psychology degree background, and we got to see a lot of individuals who were coming in and out of the hospital at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and I always liked the opportunity to talk more with folks because it gave me a better sense of their story. I mean, I joke sometimes that what I feel like I do now as a psychiatrist is a, I'm almost like Bob Ross, where I paint a picture of what a person goes through over the course of their life. I feel now that going through my training as a medical student and a psychiatrist, I enjoyed painting that bigger picture, but there's so much room for growth and adding coats and detail to that canvas for persons with substance use disorders that I've gravitated towards that to allow those people to get the treatment they deserve and hopefully train other people to get that detailed canvas themselves so they can help other individuals even beyond my time. So that's why I enjoy what I do. I'm a strong advocate of art therapy, and I hold metastatic breast cancer retreats twice a year. I've been doing those since 2006. One is for couples. The other is for women who are not in a romantic relationship, so they bring their female caregiver. So for that particular one where they're bringing their female caregiver, we do an event on Saturday evening that involves taking a paper mache mask, a full face mask, I should say, not the kind of cloth ones that we're wearing for COVID. And I ask everyone, the patient, as well as their female caregiver, which could be their mother, sister, daughter, sometimes it's their best friend. I want you to decorate and paint the outside of the mask, how you want the world to perceive you. And then I want you to paint the inside of the mask, how you perceive yourself. And I've learned a great, great deal from that for the caregivers as well as for the patients. One that I did recently, this patient was wearing pink and pink hat and pink shirt and pants and socks and shoes and pink ribbons all over. And usually patients with stage four breast cancer don't like pink. They don't like pink. And she was trying to be upbeat, like a cheerleader for everybody. And I thought, I think all this is a show. I don't think this is real. And when we got to that session, she did a pink mask, right? And put pink flowers all over it. She glued on it and all this. The inside, she painted the mask solid black. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me what this represents of how you perceive yourself. And she said, I try to be bubbly and happy and perky and wear pink so that people will still want to be around me. They still will want to invite me to go to the movies. They'll still want to spend time with me on the phone. But in fact, I think all that is left of me is breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I say that because I think that would be interesting to have your patients do masks and see how do they want the world to perceive them, particularly their family? Right. And then how do they really perceive themselves? What yeah, are they internalizing? Yeah. I think that's a great opportunity. And I feel like what I've encountered a lot of the times with my patients is that they have used alcohol so long to be able to put out an external presentation that they forget what's on the inside. And when they're uh -huh. not around the alcohol anymore, they have to rethink themselves because they can't put that same external mask on anymore. It's too harmful. So it is an interesting opportunity. And I think visually, that's a great way to play with the masks. And three questions that I always ask my metastatic patients, what are you hoping for right now? What are you most worried about right mm -hmm. now? And tell me three things that bring you joy. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't have joy, we don't have quality of life. 
we all deserve to have quality of life. We shouldn't be existing. We should be living and productive and enjoying being on this earth. I add that as something to also maybe even think about from a research perspective as to what answers people would give. <laughs> I like it. I, I like yeah. it. It goes along with the thing I usually ask at the first session with my patients. I say, well, you've had this substance that's given you a feeling of pleasure for a long time. How are you going to function without that? And what's going to replace that? And I think it gets to the elements that you're looking at. If we can get research to solve that for individuals, we'll uh -huh. have a great future. Yes, I certainly do agree. Well, thank you for joining us today to hear about how to determine when alcohol use becomes a problem. And thank you again, Dr. Antoine, for joining me and answering my long laundry list of questions. If our, our audience wants the opportunity to learn more about issues of women's health, please uh, consider registering for a Woman's Journey program in Baltimore that will be held on Saturday, October 29th. The cost is $45. You'll enjoy a heart-healthy brunch and hear one woman's journey from COVID-19 survivor who triumphed over dramatic challenges to help others. Three compelling presentations about health and well-being will enlighten you about a promising intervention for memory loss, symptoms we shouldn't ignore, and a new test to diagnose cancers, as well as learn about vitamins and supplements. And during the morning rounds, you can talk with Johns Hopkins specialists about diverse issues. For those of you who prefer or are located outside of Baltimore, you can register and actually attend virtually. For more information about this and other A Woman's Journey programs, please visit hopkinsmedicine.org front slash A Woman's Journey. We hope you will join us next month for another educational and informative podcast featuring another Johns Hopkins Medicine expert. Thank you again, Dr. Antoine. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.